Lord. Amen. Amen. Right. All right, if you got your Bibles, let's turn to Romans 12. Appreciate that. Romans 12, over the course of the day, I have developed a headache. For all you scientific people, in my frontal lobe, right there in the front. And uh, I don't get headaches very often. I get, what's, uh, I get the man flu, and I get the, the man headache. Both are severe and uh, debilitate. I mean, I, I, I don't know how, you're, a lesser man would have crumbled by now, that's all I'm saying. I don't know how I'm still standing, but uh, here we are. Oh, boy. No, no, I'm, I'm okay. I mean, if I, if I fall over, then yeah, take action. But other than that, I should be all right. Yeah. I mean, if you don't know CPR, I, it, it, then don't do it. But if you do, then I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Romans 12. Um, oh, the next Sunday school and any chance I get on Wednesday, we're going to be talking about authenticity. And what I am becoming aware of, uh, the more I'm around people, and the more I watch people, and the more I watch Christians, and the more I listen to preachers and watch preachers, and uh, there is a lot of false narratives that are being preached. And I believe that our view of Jesus has been skewed, of what he really is and who, how he was portrayed in the Bible. And I also believe that the, one, of the, one of the big questions I get asked a lot as a preacher, and I, and I really can't give you a great answer for this, but I think I can give you a biblical answer for this. Um, so I guess that's great, is the, the will of God. How do I know the will of God for my life? I, I wish I had a dollar for every time I was asked that. Chris, how do I know if I'm in the will of God? I want you to understand that the will of God is not a final destination. It's not like you're hunting for a pot of gold. And it's not like there's a road map to get there, and when you find it, that it just pops out of the box and you get a certificate that says, I'm in God's will. It's an ongoing journey. And it lasts until you take your final breath here on earth, being in God's will. But I'm afraid behind being where God wants you to be is a false narrative that everything is easy and everything is fine and everything is good and it's really simple to find the will of God for your life. And those, those are all lies. And what I want to do is, if I can, in the next couple of weeks that I get to teach and preach and whatnot, is that we're going to look at what the Bible really says about things. Because I'm afraid what we teach young Christians causes them to stumble early on in their walk with Christ. Because a lot of people think once they get saved, then everything is wonderful. And it is wonderful that you're saved. And it is wonderful that you're going to heaven. And it is wonderful that you uh, came to a place where you saw your need for your Savior. All that stuff is wonderful. But now that you are saved, there is a target on your back. Because now, where you did belong to Satan, you do not belong to him anymore. But even though he cannot have you back, he certainly wants you to stumble. So I believe we need to take a look at what the Bible really says about some things. Now, you need to do your due diligence. What I, and also what I see is that Christians are taking the word of the preacher and that's it. 
And you should trust your pastor. You should trust the preacher. But I trust you are checking what I'm telling you. I trust you're going home and reading your Bible. I trust you're going home and study. If you wasn't here Sunday morning, you missed a great Sunday school message. Brown, Brown was talking about uh, reading the Bible in a year. Y'all have those, I mean, it's all one, and, and that is a wonderful goal, to read the Bible through in a year. But I know, and I have been a part of this personally, where I have read chapters of the Bible, and I will go back and think, what did I just read? I, I, can't, I can't remember. I know I was somewhere in Genesis. I'm just going to start over again. And, and so I, I go through this pattern of where I, I am uh, trying to read the Bible without studying the Bible. It would be better if you just got one verse and got something out of it than three chapters and nothing. So we're going to take a look at what the Bible really says about some things. But you need to do your due diligence to understand that as well. If I were to ask you, and I don't, and, and, and Brian hit on this again, if I, if I were to ask you, why you believe in eternal security or why you don't believe in eternal security, I would expect you to hit me with some Bible. If I were to ask you what does baptism mean, I would expect you to hit me with some Bible. And if you cannot hit me with some Bible, that's your fault. It's not my fault. That's not Brian's fault. That's not Corey's fault, Pastor Issa and Daniels. It's your fault. But I, I know a lot of people that believe a lot of things, but they don't know why they believe it. So what I want to do is open the Bibles to where we can see what it really says and what it really means, and we can throw out anything that you've heard that's not true. We can just toss it out right now, and we can find out what the Bible says because that's the final authority, amen. My opinion really doesn't amount to much, but if the Bible says it, that's it. And there's, there's no arguing what the Bible says. At least I don't argue what the Bible says. I might not like everything the Bible says, but that doesn't make it any less true. Amen? Romans 12, 1. So we're going to talk about the, the will of God because that's very important in your life. The Bible says in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you, God, for meeting with us tonight. Lord, I thank you for the singing. I thank you for your spirit. Most of all, Lord, I thank you for sending Jesus to die for us. Lord, I pray that you'd meet with us in the time that we had left. Lord, I pray that you hide me behind the cross. God, that I decrease and you increase, Father. Most of all, Lord, I pray if there's one here tonight that doesn't know your son Jesus as their personal Savior. Lord, I pray they come to know him for the everlasting too late. I love you and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So what does it mean to be, first of all, don't answer this, I don't, I, but think in your mind, am I in God's will? Am I in God's perfect will? Now, I believe there is a permissible will, and I believe there is a perfect will. I believe that. So I want you to think about which will you're in, and how do you know you're in the will of God? I had this very bad habit. It's a super bad habit. I will be living my life, and I will say, this has got to be the will of God. But if my plan A doesn't work out, and I have to go to plan B, I said, well, this has got to be the perfect will of God because plan A didn't work out, so this has got to be the will of God. And if that doesn't work out, the third time's the charm. So plan C has to be the perfect will of God. And sometimes plan C doesn't work out, Chris. And D is equal degrees, is what I've been told. And so if I have to go to plan D, I, D has got to be the will of God. And what I find is that depending on what stage, what situation I'm in, I will substitute the word will of God for whatever's going on at the time. And I'm afraid a lot of Christians get caught up in that as well, is that instead of seeking the will of God, we are content with being exactly where we are. We're content with being here, doing what I'm doing, and if I'm in God's will, then that's great. 
And if I'm not, he'll let me know. That's what's being taught behind today's pulpits, is that the, that the will of God is easy to find. But there are certain things about the will of God that the Bible talks about that we need to understand. If we're ever going to be in the will of God, write this down, mark it down, your focus has to be on God. We will never find the will of God for our life if our focus isn't on God. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. Verse 6, And in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Now the word all there in Hebrew means with totality. So that means every part of who we are should be focused on who he is. If your focus is on your job, you cannot be in the perfect will of God. If your focus is on money, you cannot be in the perfect will of God. I'm going to explain that here in just a second how I know. If your focus is on ministry, you cannot be in the perfect will of God. You know, I see a lot of preachers, they fall out of church because they, get, they fall in love with ministry. I see a lot of Christians fall out of love with Jesus because they fall in love with ministry. They're so busy doing that they forget who they're doing it for. I've seen it, and it's, it's, a, it's something that doesn't have to happen. But the, the writer of Proverbs says, Trust in the Lord with, there's a word there, all. All thine heart. It says, in all thy ways. Acknowledge him. That means he leaves no room for our focus to be on anything else but him. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't focus on your kids. You should focus on your kids. But I have found this, is that when my priorities line up, when God is my number one priority, everything else just happens to fall into place. Because if God is my focus, that means I have to be in total obedience to him. Let me say that again. In order to be in God's will, you have to be obedient. What is obedience? That is following the scriptures. That is doing what the Bible says. The Bible says that, uh, let me find it here. I've done lost my spot. Um, or did I even write it down? We'll, we'll come back to that. I'm sorry, I lost my spot. Or maybe I just deleted it. But anyway, when it talks about the word totality and being focused all on him and how if our focus is our job we cannot be in the perfect will of God here's why we often relate being in the perfect will of God with everything being perfect right obviously if I'm in the perfect will of God then things got to be perfect right that means I'm happy that means I got joy that means I got no frustration that means everything is easy. That means money is just piling in. That means I go to church and, and I just pray and I worship and everything is so wonderful. That's not what being in the perfect will of God is. Because if we're basing, our, if we're in the perfect will of God on our emotions, our emotions lie to us. Here's how I know if your focus is money, you can't be in the perfect will of God. Money will bring you joy. So money is temporary. If our focus is on money, when we have it, we're happy. Somebody say amen. When the money is gone, we lose that joy. Why? Because our joy was dependent on the money. If our focus is our job, we are happy when we have a job. If that job disappears, our happiness is gone because our focus was on the job. If our focus is on ministry, and I can be the first to tell you, ministry can go south real fast. So if our focus is ministry, and ministry is a wonderful thing, and ministry can bring joy, but ministry can go south real fast. And when the ministry goes south, we lose our joy. 
because our focus is on ministry. So now, if our focus then shifts to God. If our focus is on God, there's some, there are things that God just cannot do. God cannot let me down. He's never let me down. God cannot sin. God is always there. God is always on time. God is loved. Jesus died for me. All those things are a constant in my life. And I can get joy and happiness. And I can build my faith in the word of God. So if all these things are a constant and cannot be taken away, if my focus is on this, then even though things may get rough, my joy will always be here. Because my focus is now on him. I'm not worried about my next pay raise. I'm worried about him providing for me. Whether that means ravens have to come and drop food on my doorstep, or whether somebody just decides to pay one of my bills, or whether somebody just comes to my house and says, hey, I'm praying for you. Or they pick up a phone call or pick up a phone and call me or text me and say, hey, I'm praying for you. And I get cards at the strangest times from this lady down, down in Charleston. Her name's Miss Jenny. She sends me a card at the strangest times whenever I need to say, Chris, I'm just praying for you. Or she'll send me a message. I miss you and Jody. I'm praying for you. All these things happen at the strangest times when my focus is on him. We cannot be in the will of God if our focus is elsewhere. If our focus is on our job tomorrow. Jobs are important. I'm not saying you should just forget about your job. But I'm saying if our focus is on God, he takes care of everything else. Our job will let us down. I, me, will let you down. If you depend on me, if you follow me around for one day, probably not, it won't even take a full day. I'll let you down within the first hour. I promise. Guaranteed. Take it to the bank. I will ride in the car with, right home with me. And I will let you down on the way home. I may let you down before I get out of the parking lot. But God has never let me down. So how, how do I know I'm in the, in the will of God? Well, a good, a good first step is you're fixing your focus to Him. That your main focus is pleasing Him. Now, focusing on Him and being in His will doesn't mean things are going to be easy. I see a lot of Christians that quit when things get hard. And the truth is, they were probably right where they needed to be. They were probably right smack dab in the middle of God's will, but because it was not easy, they quit. If you read the Bible long enough, and you ain't got to read it very long and very far, you will find men and women of God who were in God's will, but were going through the trial of a lifetime. There are times that God has to put us through the fire to burn out all the impurities that we have. God, God, cannot, God can't take you to where he needs you to go where you're at right now. He's got he's to he's gotta build you up. We do this one lift at CrossFit called an overhead squat. It's exactly how it sounds. You take weight, you put it over your head, and you squat. Right? It's super, I know, super complicated. I know, I know it's... It, it sounds, it sounds easy enough, but it's one of the more difficult lifts for me because putting the weight over my head, not that, not that tough. To be honest, i got short arms. I don't have to push weight very high, very far, and I'm short. I happen to be 5'8 ish, depending on what shoes I'm wearing. My driver's license says 5'9. That's a lie. I wanted to sound taller than what I was. I was 16. Sue me. So, the overhead squat is typically 95 pounds. That's, that is, that's what the required weight is on most lifts. Now, in order to get it up there, you either put it behind your head and press it, or you snatch it up and it's over your head. Your arms are fully extended, and then you squat. And I'm not talking about like a half squat, like, something, like this right here. That's not a squat. That's embarrassing. I'm talking about a full squat all the way down. That's a squat. 
Now, it sounds easy enough, 95 pounds is not heavy until it's over your head. And until your arms are locked out, and now your shoulders are getting tired. And now... You have to keep your core tight because if you come forward, the weight goes this way, you have to drop it. If it goes this way, the weight goes back, you have to drop it. You got it, all, all the bow, Everything has to be in perfect unison. But once you get everything where it's supposed to be, you're in what's called the pocket. You get, our coach always says, Chris, find the pocket. So I'm just trying to find my next breath. But he says, find the pocket. And if you can get in that pocket, it is still a challenge. It's still hard. But when the form is good and everything's the way it's supposed to be, the squat is no problem. You feel how light 95 pounds is. But only when the form's right. Only when your shoulders are locked out. Only when you got a bunch of air in. Only when you're keeping your core tight. Only when you find that balance. Only when the weight's on your heels. You find the pocket. It's still hard. But you find the pocket and you can do it. What happens with a lot of Christians is we get the weight over our head. And we throw it down because it's too hard. We get, we get a couple things right. But then we throw it down. If we would just wait long enough we'd find the pocket. If you just wait long enough, you, you, you would be able to squat below parallel. If you just wait long enough, it wouldn't be that bad. If you just wait long enough, you can knock the reps out. But when it gets tough, we quit. We're not willing to wait to find the pocket. To get to where God wants you to go, you've got to make the changes necessary to get there. God can't take you where you want to go, where he wants you to go, where you're at right now. If you're still the same Christian you were when you got saved, something's wrong. Something's bad wrong. I mean, for all those of you who had kids, did they stay a newborn? No, they grew up, they grew up so fast, right? Brady just turned six years old. I cannot believe it. I remember the day he was born like it was yesterday. We went into the hospital at 7 o'clock. At 7.50 a.m., Brady was born, and the world was never the same. I remember like it was yesterday, but he grow, he, he's growing so fast. And I remember when he was two, and he had that long, curly hair. Some of y'all may remember Brady's long locks. They were beautiful. He had long locks, and he couldn't talk very well. Actually, as a matter of fact, he couldn't talk at all. He didn't jibber-jabber. He didn't do any of those things. And now I look, he's six years old, got a pretty good head of hair on him. He got it cut, not my idea. And now he never shuts up. From the time he wake, opens those eyes, to the time he closes them, sometimes he talks in his sleep. I'm not kidding. He doesn't stop talking. But I, we celebrated his birthday, and I'm thinking how fast six years went by. And how he's grown so much. And it's because we fed him, we gave him something to eat, we gave him something to drink, he got some sleep, he'd get out in the sun, he'd do all these things, and he started to grow. As a Christian, if you're not growing, you are malnourished. You need to get in the Word, you need to pray, you need to come to church, you need to come to these women Bible studies if you're a lady. Men, you need, you need to come to Sunday school. You need to come to Sunday night. You need to come to Wednesday night. You need to get inside of your Bible because if you're the same Christian you were when you first got saved, something's wrong. I don't know how I got down that rabbit trail, but I did. Being in the will of God is not always easy. Uh, Peter uh, says, For it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for doing evil. We have in the garden... That Christ, he says, the Bible says, he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thou will. John the Baptist said, I must decrease, but he, he must increase. So what, so what these men are saying, even Christ himself is saying, is that my 
will is trumped by the will of the Father. There is a difference between my plan and God's will. All of us have a plan. All of us think that our plan and God's will for our lives is that we win the lottery, win billions of dollars, and we all drive sweet cars and have huge houses and our kids are super successful. And that's, that's what we think God's will is. Maybe God's will is for us to stay in the fire for a little bit. Job was, Job was going through the fire. The Bible said that Job was a righteous man that eschewed evil. And yet God offered him up to Satan and he was still in the will of God going through complete hell. And we read about Jesus. He's, he's getting ready to go to the cross. And he's in the garden praying, God, if, 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 if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But if it can't, it's okay. I'll take your will instead. You see, I think a lot of us, when we go through that, when we go through the fire, and we're going through that trial, we think it's God's way of punishing us. Maybe God isn't punishing you. Maybe he's preparing you for what's coming next. The next thing is you're going to have to make some difficult choices to be in the will of God. Let me say it again because that just didn't go that that didn't go over well at all. You're going to have to make some difficult choices to be in the will of God. You know when when this church first started, I was a youth pastor in this building when it was central. And I loved being a youth pastor. I loved it. You know why I love being a youth pastor? Because I can still influence a teenager. They will listen to me. They loved me. They would uh, message me and tell me about all their little teenage problems. Some super silly. Some super stupid. And some super important. And I took pride in that. I took it serious. I took being a youth pastor serious. And I loved it. I loved being a youth pastor. And then, God put on my heart truth. Now, I want you to understand, when I was at Central, I had all the support I could ever want. I never had to beg people to come help me decorate. I never had to beg people to help me clean up. I never had, I, I had help every youth event we did. People would just come. People I didn't even invite, they just show up. And they would help, and they would stay after, and they would clean, and they would sweep. And I, I got all the support I ever wanted. And it was fun, and I loved it. And I loved seeing God move in the lives of teenagers. And then God put truth into my heart. This was a conflict for me because I was very comfortable being a youth pastor. And I was getting ready to embark on something with Corey. Corey's been my best friend since I was 15 years old. And I trusted Corey. But I'll be honest, when, when he says, hey, man, we're going to start a church, I'm like, yeah, cool. It sounds like a really good idea until it's time to legally become a church and you're wondering where you're going to have church and if anyone is going to show up, and if in a year from now you're still going to be a church. All the while, you have jerks over to my left, and jerks, I'm being nice now, jerks to my right, telling me that there's too many Baptist churches in the area anyway. And after a while, I started to believe them. You know, he's right, there are a lot of Baptist churches and I got a really good where I'm at. I had to make a decision. Am I going to stay here? Or am I going to follow God? Sometimes you got to make the hard choices to be in the will of God. Matthew 19, 21 says, Jesus said to him, If thou wilt be perfect, he's talking to this kid. 
I don't know if he's a, if, I don't know if he's a kid or not. I would assume so. Rich, they call him the rich young ruler, so I'm gonna assume he's young. And you know, the older I get, 34 doesn't sound too old anymore. So, he, 18. I'm gonna say he's 18. Young man. He's got a lot of stuff, and he go. He has enough wherewithal to go to Jesus and say, "Hey, what do I got to do, good master? What must I do to inherit eternal life?" And then Jesus runs down this laundry list of things he has to do. Uh, 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 he gets the commandments, is what he really does. And the the guy says, "Well, I've done that since my youth. What am I missing?" And Jesus says, "Go sell all thou hast and give to the poor." And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful. Why? For he had great possessions. Now, this young man had to make a choice. I'm either going to sell everything I got. I'm going to sell my home. I'm going to sell my cars. I don't have to, he probably didn't have cars, but bear with me. This is my version of the Bible. He had cars, and, and he had money, he had houses. And Christ says, hey, sell all that. But not only that, come with me. Now, the man would look at Christ, and he would see, you know, Christ walked everywhere that he went. He was fully man, so well, you need to understand that. He was fully man, and he was out in the sun all day. And he'd walk everywhere, and they would, they, he would be dirty, and, 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 some, and you, you, know, you know how men get when they get sweaty and all these things. He looks at this guy who's probably dressed real nice, dressed to the nines, and says, come with me. Come with you? i got a lot of cool stuff back here. I don't think so. And as far as we know, there's no record to indicate this man ever got saved. His choice, rather than following Jesus was follow himself, follow what he knew, follow what was comfortable for him. In Luke uh, 9, 59, it says, he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go, be- to go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Jesus is going to ask you to make tough decisions. To be in his will, you have to make tough decisions. I'm sorry, there's no other way around it. Sometimes that means separating yourself from people who won't allow you to be in the will of God. Let me say that again because I think that's a good one right there. If this group of people... It's keeping you from serving God, then you need to get away from that group of people. He says, let the dead go and bury the dead. Go preach the kingdom of God. We got to make difficult choices. Sometimes it's the change of a job. Sometimes you have to leave your church. I understand that. Sometimes you have to do this. Sometimes you have to make a change. Sometimes you have to move. Sometimes God's calling you here and God's calling you there. And these are all difficult choices that have to be made to be in the will of God. Difficult choices. Look at the apostles. They they left their livelihood to go follow him. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They, they, They were all these things. They left what they knew to go follow him. I have always found this. A lot of the time, God's will for my life is out of my comfort zone. Out of my comfort zone. It is out of my comfort zone to get up here and preach. Because I know who I am. And I know what I fight over there in that chair every time. Tonight, no exception. Every time I get up to preach or teach, I fight in my, in my mind. Tell me I'm not good enough. I, I, I'm worthless. You're not a good Christian. You're not a good pastor. You're not a good husband. You're not a good father. I, I hear all these things. God took me out of my comfort zone. Why? Because he couldn't use me where I was. He couldn't use me in my comfort zone. 
It's out of my comfort zone to run the screens. Now, the screens look really easy because those verses, those verses just flash up there like that. Until you get a preacher who throws about 400 curveballs and they give you their notes and say, this is what I'm using. And then they take those notes and they just kind of wad them up and throw them over here and they shoot from the hip and they say, hey, pull this, pull this up. And all of a sudden I've forgotten how to spell Job. And, I'll, and I'm, trying, I'm back there trying to type it out and I can't pull Job up. How do you spell Matthew? I have no idea. I didn't know Matthew was even a real word. How do you spell Luke? And all these things happen. And running the screens is out of my comfort zone. But getting me from behind here to run the screens on Sunday allows Daniel Noel, who is very good at this, to lead service on Sunday mornings. Daniel brings this energy that makes me mad. Because I, I just don't have that energy. that he, It's got to be the coffee. But sometimes God moves you out of your comfort zone to move somebody else in. Think about that. And then point number three, and we're going to go to the house. Repeat steps one and two. How often do we repeat these steps? As often as necessary. Because the Bible says there in Romans that we are not, but not to be conformed but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It doesn't give a time frame there. And it's awesome the way this word is translated in the Greek for renewing is renovation. So anytime your mind needs renovated is when you do it. Anytime you get some decay going on in your mind, it's time for a renovation. Anytime the gospel ever gets stale to you, it's time for a renovation. Anytime you ever find yourself focusing on things other than God, it's time for a renovation. You can be a man after God's own heart and fall, after, fall out of the will of God. You can be in the will of God right now and in 10 minutes fall completely out. Now, I don't think you choose them Wendy's over Taco Bell will do it. I don't think that's particularly what God has in mind right there. And I don't think it has much to do if you make a phone call to this person or that person or not. Or whether you watch ESPN or whether you watch Fox Sports. Or whether you like the Reds or whether you like the Braves. Or whether you like the 49ers or whether you like the 49ers. It has nothing to do with that. See what I did there? But I do believe that direct disobedience, which the Bible compares to witchcraft, which the Bible calls a sin, I do believe can take you out of the will of God like that. Paul says to be renewed, a, a complete renovation. This is a daily thing. It's, I love the prayers, God, I want your will to be done today. That's it? This for today, that covers the whole day? Your prayer this morning covers your whole day? That's awesome. How do, I, I want whatever you got. Because I got to bite my tongue in half half the time. I feel like I'm always constantly praying about something. I'm always constantly praying for me to watch my mouth. Watch your temper. Because I'm, easy, I'm triggered. I'm easily triggered sometimes. I try to play it cool here, but I can fly off the handle real quick. I feel like I'm always praying about that. And I feel like I'm always praying about this. And I feel like I'm always praying, God, 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 why aren't you doing this? And God, why aren't you doing that? And I'm always in a constant state of prayer. And if I'm not careful, I can fall out. God can take me out of where he's placed me. If we read in the book of 2 Samuel, this is how I know you can fall out of the will of God. Because I believe David falls out of the will of God right here. It is never the will of God for you to sin. It is, thank you. He's, he said it like he meant it, Brian. It is never the will of God for you to sin. The Bible says in 2 Samuel 11, 1, It came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle. David was a king. It was time for him to go to battle. That David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. 
Now, I don't know if, if uh, Joab done this. I don't think so. It didn't say. But when David says, nah, man, I'm staying here, I wonder if Joab's like, for sure. Sure you don't want to come. I heard, I heard it's the time that you should be going. I'm just wondering if you being the king, want to go, because I'm not the king. But if you go, that means, you know, you're going, and that's what you're supposed to do. He's like, no, nah, I'm good. I don't know if Joab ever done that. Probably not. Joab was probably a good soldier and just done what he was told. But David wasn't where he was supposed to be. And David goes to the rooftop, and, he, and we all know the story how he watches Bathsheba uh, 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 taking a bath and how he calls for her. And we know that they have a child together. And now David knows that he's messed up. And he tries to bring Uriah home. But Uriah was also a good soldier. He says, I'm just going to sleep right here on the front door until you send me back to battle. What a good soldier. He says, fine. Hey, send him back to the heat of the battle. Find, find out where, every, where, the, where the biggest, baddest dudes are. Send Uriah there. So Uriah goes and he dies. David is out of the will of God. Why? It is never God's will for you to sin. That's why the Bible says the renewing of your mind. David had a chance to change his mind. He could have sent Joab and said, whoa, 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 you know what? I'm going. He's the king. He can do whatever he wants to do. And when he goes to the rooftop, he could have went back inside. And when he calls Bathsheba, when she comes over, he could have said, you know what? I've made a terrible mistake. Go back home. But he doesn't do any of those things. And I'm not picking on David because I'm capable of much worse than what David is. And so are you. Don't think that you're not. I'm no better than David. But what I'm telling you is this, is that David falls out of the will of God because he doesn't renew his mind and he decides to be disobedient in sin. You cannot be in the will of God living in sin. You can't do it. Sorry, you can't. God does not demand that we sin. God demands that we're holy. God, His will for us is to conform to the image of His Son, Jesus. God's will is for us to be Christ-like. So Chris, how in the world do I even get in the will of God? You've told me everything there is. How do I get in the will of God? You, you, you seek God and you're obedient to His Word. That is the best advice I ever got, and that's the advice I'm giving to you, is that if you are obedient and you seek God, you will be in God's will. But when we start seeking our own plan and we start going after our own lust, you're not in God's will, honey. You're in your own plan. Being in the fire does not mean God is mad at you. It does not mean that He is punishing you. It could be He is changing you for what's coming next. So I don't know where you're at tonight, and I don't know what's going on in, in your lives, but I, I, I do know this. God has a will and a plan for your life. It is my prayer that I can assist you in finding that. Every head bowed and every eye closed.